I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where'd he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. I mean, does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? Welcome to our Father's Plan. It's good to be with you again. We're studying the Bible together. I'm Jeff Cavins, and I'm here with Dr. Scott Hahn from Franciscan University. Good to have you. Good to be here, Jeff. We're having fun. We sure are. We've had a number of series, a number of uh, programs where we've been talking about the Bible, uh, specifically uh, helping you to read through the Bible in chronological order. You know, for, the, for most people, and I know for myself when I first started reading the Bible, it's very, very difficult to make my way through the Bible. First of all, it's not written in necessarily chronological order. Right. And so it, uh, we have to sort of put it in order for ourselves, and that's what we're hoping to do for, our, for you, our, our viewers, today. Right now, we're in the segment called The Return, and uh, this will involve the historical books of Ezra, and Nehemiah. This comes on the heel of the exile. The children of Israel have been exiled. Uh, Israel to the north was exiled uh, by, uh, into uh, Syria in the year 722. And in the year 586, a couple of centuries later, Judah was exiled into Babylon. Three deportations. And in those deportations, we have Daniel taken away into Babylon in the first deportation. We have Ezekiel in the second deportation. And then Jerusalem was destroyed in the third deportation. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the return in just a few minutes. But Dr. Hahn, I'd like to talk to you just for a moment about um, uh, a couple of tape series that might, might make it easier for our viewers if they were to obtain these tape series to... Uh, to read through the Bible and salvation history, because I know you have one specific tape series about salvation history that really helped me. And everywhere I go, er, the people that I talk to always comment on that they've got a Scott Hahn tape, you know, in the in the car at home. And your your tapes have had an unusual impact on people in the Catholic Church. I've talked to a lot of my students that that listen to them. Can you give us a couple of recommendations that might help us to go a little bit deeper? In sure. The one that you mentioned is called Salvation History, and that's available from St. Joseph Communication. It's a, a five-tape series that basically does a chronological and theological overview of salvation history, uh, focusing upon the covenant understood as a family, looking at how God fathers His family throughout the Old Testament, leading up to the Catholic Church as the climax of the Old Testament. A second tape series is called Finding Christ in the Old Testament. And that focuses upon how the early church fathers imitated Jesus and the apostles in interpreting the Bible in light of the Christ event, in light of Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament. And how to find Christ in the Old Testament teaches you the basics of typology. That is, in the Old Testament with the Passover, uh, the Lamb, with the Exodus, the Tabernacle, the High Priest, and so on. These are all symbols or figures or what they call types that typify or prefigure Jesus Christ who perfects and completes their meaning. And so a typological approach to the Old Testament is really built upon the New Testament interpretation of the Old. And I show how that makes the Bible come alive in that second tape series. Uh, one thing I also wanted to say too, uh, you talked about these two different captivities. The captivity of Israel in the north by Assyria in 722 BC and the captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 by Babylon. A lot of people fail to distinguish between the 12 tribes of Israel and the Jews. You see, uh, it's important to distinguish the fact that Israel, the 10 tribes of the kingdom of Israel in the north, were deported and they never returned to the land. Those are sometimes spoken of as the lost, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. However, Judah, in its captivity, in its deportations back in uh, the 6th century, they of course do return to the land, mm -hmm. but only Judah. And so this gives rise to what we would re refer to as Judaism. The birth of Judaism really coincides with the return of the Jews from Judah to Judea, especially Jerusalem. 
we often use those words, Jews and Hebrews and Israelites, in, in interchangeable terms, sure. and that's all right, but it's sometimes helpful to clarify and distinguish those meanings. That's good. Yeah. That's really good. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look into the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and the return. It's, uh, it's a fascinating period, mm -hmm. and we'll be back in just a moment to pick up on our study. Grab your Bible, open up to Ezra and Nehemiah. We look forward to seeing you in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to our Father's Plan. Well, we're, we're sort of heading towards the end of the Old Testament. The uh, subsequent programs will be on the New Testament. And we're heading towards the, the end of the Old right now. We just finished up, if you look at the chart with me, uh, in the 14 chronological books of Bible history, we just finished with 2 Kings, the exile, where the, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, was taken away into captivity. Well, the prophets spoke about how long they would be in captivity in Babylon, specifically 70 years. During this 70-year period, if you will look on the timeline with me here, you'll see that there is a change in world power from the Babylonians to the Persians. The Persian king Cyrus, God moved on his heart and uh, moved on his heart in such a way that he allowed the children of Israel to return after 70 years back into the land. But things are going to be quite a bit different. The historical books that we want to read at this point are the books of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. If you look on the chart with me here, after the 70-year exile, we have Ezra, number 10, and we have Nehemiah, number 11. What I'd like you to notice is the books that should be read in context of Ezra and Nehemiah. If you really want to understand the prophet Haggai, and you want to really understand the prophet Zechariah or Malachi, they should really be understood in the context of Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, that's important for reading all of the prophets. You'll get much more out of the prophets when you read them in their historical context. Well, after Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, gave a decree allowing the, the children of Israel or the kingdom of Judah to return to Jerusalem because it had been destroyed, we have three returns that we want to talk about that are very, very important to look at. The first of the three returns takes place uh, after the, uh, the deportation, after 70 years, and the first individual to return is a man by the name of Zerubbabel. If you look on the timeline here, you will see Zerubbabel under the period of the return. Zerubbabel is part of the first wave of people coming back from Babylonian captivity, and he is going to rebuild the temple. But it's not going to be nearly as beautiful a temple as the first temple. In fact, some of the people who returned wept because the temple just wasn't as beautiful. Now, while the children of Israel were up in captivity, some interesting things happened during this time. Uh, the synagogue was developed. Judaism, as we understand it, really comes out of this period, as Dr. Hans spoke about just a few minutes ago. Well, Zerubbabel leads the children back in the first wave, and he rebuilds the temple. He rebuilds the temple. The second wave of return is the scribe Ezra. He leads this return, and this takes place quite a, quite a, a, a while after the first return, about 80 years after the first return. We have Ezra, the scribe, coming back, and he really introduces the Word of God. The third return after the exile comes 13 years after the second return. And the individual that led this particular turn, return is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So look again at my chart here, the return. We have Zerubbabel in the first return, Ezra in the second return. We have Nehemiah in the third return. They've come back in the land. And we're going to talk with Dr. Hahn in a few minutes about what this means as far as our Father's plan. But I'd like you to see here once again, we have prophets speaking during this time. Now, when you listen to Haggai, the prophet speaking to the people, they've come back into the land, they're trying to rebuild the temple, but they get kind of lazy and they start focusing on their own homes and their own needs. And Haggai really gets on them about that. Well, Haggai will be an interesting prophet to read in light of uh, the return. After the return, we really move into our last period of uh, history in the Old Testament. And this is called the Maccabean Revolt. We have two books in our Bible, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And uh, we focus here 
on the Maccabean Revolt at the end. This, is, this is really closes out the Old Testament. The Maccabean Revolt is an interesting story, very, very interesting. You see, the Persians were in control. They took, it over, they took control over from the Babylonians, but then the Greeks would take control. And the man that led that uh, worldwide domination is someone I'm sure that you're familiar with, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great lived from 356 to 323 BC. He had an interesting uh, youth uh, experience. From the age of 13, he was tutored by a man that you probably have heard of, and that man is the philosopher Aristotle. And uh, uh, Alexander the Great was the son of Philip of Macedonia. Well, Alexander the Great ended up taking over almost the entire world at that time. He was a masterful military strategist. And uh, I think it was about 11 years or so, about 11 years that he was uh, really in power. He was a formidable foe and military strategist because he would go before his army and he was wounded an awful lot. Well, he takes over the entire area, but then he suddenly dies. He comes to a tragic end very, very quickly. He's a very smart military strategist, but he didn't make any plans for the, as far as who's going to take over his empire after he's gone. Well, the empire was sort of divvied up between his generals. Two of the prominent generals were the, 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 went to the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, those two, those two groups of people, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. The Ptolemies reigned near Egypt, and the Seleucids were up in Syria and Mesopotamia. Well, for a number of years, the, the, the children of Israel back in the land were under the rule of the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemies let them go about their business as usual for the most part. But then after a period of time, the Seleucids took over. The Seleucids took over, and uh, they caused all kinds of problems. You see, Alexander the Great, his goal was really to Hellenize the world, that is, to, Gre to introduce the Greek language and customs to the whole known world. And uh, the Seleucids picked up on this campaign, and they would not allow Israel just to go about business as usual. They wanted to Hellenize the world. Well, a man, one of the Seleucid rulers, one of the uh, Seleucid rulers by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, exerts control over this area and has great influence. In fact, his generals come into the area and uh, cause a lot of problems. It is Antiochus Epiphanes that really desecrated the temple, came in and uh, erected uh, statues to foreign gods, sacrificed pigs in the temple, and caused uh, great, great pain in Israel. He thought he would make an example of one particular man by the name of Mattathias, a righteous man who lived in a small town just northwest of Jerusalem, about 14 miles or so. His name was Mattathias. The town was called Medin. The general, Antiochus's general, comes to the town and he wants to make an example of Mattathias and asks Mattathias to sacrifice to these foreign gods. Of course, Mattathias says, no way. I mean, Mattathias is a man who has learned through, from, from the history of Israel that he's not going to worship foreign gods. And he says, no way. At this point, another man steps forward, another Jew steps forward and says that he will. And at that point, Mattathias takes out his knife and slices his throat. That was the beginning of the Maccabean Revolt. It was only a few years until they took back the temple, but the entire revolt lasted for over 20 years. But finally, they took back the territory. And that's the Maccabean period. We'll talk a little bit about that with Dr. Hahn also. And that really brings us to the end of the Old Testament, it sets the stage for the coming of the Messiah, the son of David the son of Abraham. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a small break right now. We're going to be back and we're going to talk to Dr. Hahn about the closing episode here of the Old Testament. And then in our future programs, we're going to look into the New Testament. We'll be right back. Open your Bible to Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Maccabees, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to our Father's Plan. Well, we're looking at the book of Ezra, and we're looking at the book of Nehemiah, and we're also looking at the book of First Maccabees. This sort of uh, brings us to a, a conclusion of the Old Testament. We've been through so much history, starting in Genesis and, 
and uh, move, it seems like we've moved up and down and God's plan has become <laughs> complex at different points. And here we are at the end of the Old Testament, the children of Israel, specifically Judah in the south, they have been in exile for 70 years. There's been a change of command from the Babylonian rule to the Persian rule. And Cyrus has allowed them to come back into the land. We have three returns back into the land. We have Zerubbabel, we have Ezra, and we have Nehemiah coming into the land. The temple has been rebuilt. It's not as beautiful as the, as the first temple. We have Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi prophesying during this time. Uh, we move into the Maccabean revolt where uh, Antiochus Epiphanes profanes the temple. Uh, Mattathias and the Maccabean brothers revolt, take back the temple. And we move into a period uh, that's better known as the Hasmonean period. And then in 63 BC, right before Jesus, Rome will come in. And I was just thinking that in our last program, we talked about the prophecy of Daniel, and we spoke about Daniel's dream and how he saw uh, four successive uh, kingdoms coming about and uh, we see all of these kingdoms rapidly, one after another coming about and we're, we're quickly approaching the new covenant. We're approaching the new covenant there. So that's where we're at at the end of the Old Testament. Now in terms of our Father's plan, Dr. Han, what, uh, what is going on at, at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. We have to back up again just to get a little more perspective. Uh, we could back all the way up to Deuteronomy and just remember that Moses prepared the people of Israel for everything that has happened because he gave them the Deuteronomic Covenant which stipulated these laws, divided up Israel in terms of the Levitical clergy and the 12 tribes as the laity, and then he attached blessings and curses, blessings for obedience which were experienced for a few centuries, and then the curses of for disobedience which have now been experienced for hundreds of years by the people of God. Now, the curses culminate in the exile. That is sort of like the, the latest, the greatest, the worst of the curses. And this exile was originally going to be a 70-year period of punishment, mm -hmm. chastisement, to uh, restore the people to holiness. Jeremiah announced this, and 2 Chronicles 36, 31 describes how the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, 70 years you'll be off the land, because it will be 70 years that the land will finally keep its Sabbaths. That's a, a somewhat obscure statement, but if you look back, you'll discover that the kingdom period lasted approximately 490 years. Now, according to the, the law of Moses in Deuteronomy, every seven years you were to have a sabbatical, a Sabbath year. Mm -hmm. The land was to lie fallow. But in fact, according to Jeremiah, for 490 years they didn't keep the covenant, and that covenant breaking was symbolized in the neglect of the Sabbath year. So Jeremiah is saying with a certain amount of uh, prophetic irony, oh, the land will rest. <laughs> you know, pay me now or pay me later. Exactly. Okay. For 490 years, every seven years, that's seven times 70 equals 490. So there'll be 70 years of Sabbath rest for the land because you won't be living there to farm the land. Now, after 70 years, you describe these waves of returning exiles. Mm -hmm. And those exiles returning to the land represent a partial fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah, of uh, Jeremiah, and also of Ezekiel and Daniel, inasmuch as you have a sort of new exodus or second exodus. But I want to stress partial fulfillment. Because if you look closely at the events that you've described uh, masterfully, you will see a certain pattern because on the one hand, not all 12 tribes returned to the land. That's right. Really, the Jews did and they returned to Judea, but they never returned and restored all of the lands allotted to the 12 tribes. And in fact, not only did the 12 tribes not return, but when the Jews returned, they returned without a Davidic king. Now, Zerubbabel was a Davidic descendant, and there's no question that the exiles returning from captivity hoped that Zerubbabel would be crowned and become the Davidic king. But the Persian authorities must have got wind of this because they recalled him and he returned to Persia never to be crowned king. So here is a time where there are not only uh, not 12 tribes, but there's no Davidic king. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, there is uh, no Ark of the Covenant. That was removed, not until Harrison Ford found it. <laughs> <laughs> there really is nothing, it's not spoken of in Scripture, really, is it? That's right. The Holy of Holies, the sanctuary in the second temple, the rebuilt temple, was empty. No Ark of the Covenant, no cherubim, no mercy seat. 
Hmm. And so, sure, it's a fulfillment, but it's a, a partial fulfillment. And so when Haggai announces the word of the Lord in chapter 2, verse 9, you know, he is speaking to, he's speaking to some veterans who saw the glory days, who heard about the Solomonic Temple before it was destroyed. And these guys are, you know, looking at the, the prospects of building a second temple. They look at the poverty of the people. They look at the lack of independence and power. They look at the, uh, the social circumstances. They look at the beginning of the second temple. And they're weeping. Yeah. They're like, this is nothing. Right. But the word of the Lord comes and says, no, in my eyes, the splendor of the latter house, the second temple, will surpass the earlier one. But it's, now, not, it's not talking about Zerubbabel's temple, though. That's yeah. right. Ultimately, of course, that's pointing forward to a much greater temple okay. to come. But in a spiritual sense, Haggai's uh, word does apply to his own generation because God is looking at what people build in their poverty, in their faith, in their humility, in their love of God. And it's like the widow's might. God sees a greater abundance in the sacrifice of the poor than in the wealth of Solomon applied to a much more glorious temple. Mm -hmm. So God has stripped his people in this period of their political sovereignty, of their social independence. They are, as you pointed out, under the domination of four successive Gentile empires, not until the coming of the Christ will they actually be brought out from under that Gentile burden. Now you've got to wonder why, especially in light of the fact that God had sworn a covenant oath to David uh, concerning the Davidic line. And, and here you see a three, four, five hundred, peer, five hundred years in which there is no Davidic king reigning. That is a long time. Oh, can you imagine? It, it would be almost equivalent to Catholics living for three, four, five hundred years without a pope, and yet they're looking at Matthew 16 and Jesus' promise to Peter and the gift of the keys and 2,000 years of succession and popes, and then all of a sudden, what would Catholics do if we went through five centuries of popeless Catholicism? Here they're going through five centuries of kingless Judaism. You know what it reminds me, it makes me think of rather, is that you have this entire period of s apparent silence. Yeah. And it's amazing to me how our Father's plan is, is going ahead even in silence. And it reminds me of the prophet, I don't recall which prophet said it, that he loves us in silence. Yes. He loves us in silence. And even in, you know, in our own lives, uh, in your life, in my life, uh, we go through periods in our lives where it's silent. You know, it might be for us, it's two or three months and we get all excited, you know, and are all depressed about the silence in our lives. Can you imagine four or five hundred years where it seems to be silent? Yeah, and in these, in these three or four hundred years of silence, God is speaking softer, mm -hmm. but more profoundly. Oh, beautiful. And he has, he has transformed his people from being a national kingdom into really a national priesthood, where sacrifice, holy sacrifice, is the central reality of their culture and life. The temple that they rebuild then really becomes the focal point, not only of their religion, but of their economics, of their education, of their entire life as a society under covenant with God. And the people who are not Levites, but the people who return to rebuild Jerusalem, like Nehemiah and others, they are being called to a higher degree of holiness than the Deuteronomic Covenant Law. You see, Ezra launches this whole new program of marriage reforms mm -hmm. for the Jews returning. Even the non-Levites, who formerly had been allowed to take foreign women as wives, when they get to Jerusalem, because they're not just going to be living on their old landed allotments, they're going to be living in very holy land. Ezra says, it's time to expel all your foreign wives if you want to be part of God's covenant family. So the covenant that is renewed in Nehemiah 8 and 9 and Ezra 9 requires the people who are going to come into the covenant to attain a higher degree of holiness than ever before, not only through the temple sacrifices done by the Levites, but in their own marriage and family life. They have to rise to the holier mm -hmm. standards of marriage that have been required of the priests alone up until now. It, That's yeah. an important part of it all. It reminds me of uh, what's spoken of in the New Testament, the pruning process mm. that uh, we started at the very beginning in Genesis 3.15 with the, the Proto-Evangelium, the first pronouncement of the gospel. And then that acorn begins to grow and branch and branch and branch. And you would think that, if, I mean, if I was in charge of the vineyard or you were in charge of the vineyard, I think I'd just let the thing grow because it looks better, you know, bigger. That's right. But we seem to have a pruning process where we have a, a smaller group of people, but they are get, becoming holy. 
a threat. They are being prepared by God the Father to become more like Christ the Son in His poverty, in His weakness. Therein, God manifests the power and the all-surpassing authority mm. of God. It isn't through might. It isn't through military strength. It isn't through political domination. Uh, I, 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 uh, I remember Mother Teresa years ago addressing a Harvard graduating class. She gave a commencement address, and you think, boy, you know, she's walking into a very secular environment. She better pull her punches a little bit, but she didn't pull a single one. I, I remember reading the transcript of her address. She was basically calling these secularized people to deep repentance, repentance in their own relationship with God, repentance in their marriages, repentance from abortion and fornication. I mean, words so striking, so strong. You know, I can't imagine what would have happened if I got up. If I had gotten up there and spoken those words, I think I would have been booed off the stage and treated violently after a minute or two. Mm -hmm. Instead, when she was done, she got a standing ovation that I think lasted almost 10 minutes. Wow. Now, how could she get away with that? quite simple. She embodies a greater sacrifice than she is calling forth from her listeners. She's won the right to be heard. Mm -hmm. She doesn't just assume the right. She's won the right. So through self-sacrifice, love can require, love can inspire, in effect, more than law requires, more than military coercion can induce. So God has brought His people low so that Stripped of political power, he can give them spiritual authority. Without secular kingship, they now have priestly authority. And it's fitting in that light that you'd find in Zechariah 6, not Zerubbabel, the Davidic descendant being crowned, but the word of Zechariah comes to Zerubbabel and Yeshua, the high priest who is working alongside of this Davidic prince, Zerubbabel. The word comes to Zechariah in chapter 6, verse 11, take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it upon the head of, you'd expect it to say, Zerubbabel. In fact, some translations actually take great liberties, like the New American Bible inserts Zerubbabel mm -hmm. because the translators feel as though it must have read that at one point. Without any textual evidence, there isn't a single text of Zechariah that says Zerubbabel. They all say Yeshua. My, my Bible says Joshua. Yeah, so you set this crown upon the head of Yeshua, the high priest. Why would the high priest be crowned if Zerubbabel is there? And it goes on, and say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up in his place and shall build the temple of the Lord. And it goes on, he shall bear royal honor and there shall be a priest by his throne. So here is a unique picture of the high priest being God's representative. The high priest, not the Davidic king, but the high priest being the spiritual father figure over God's earthly family. And so he is crowned. Why? Because God is, God is leading his people gradually to see, once again, a lesson we've recognized in other earlier periods, that your power is not in kingly might and political coercion and military strength. Your power is in your priesthood. God has been calling Israel to be a firstborn son nation, right. to be a kingdom of priests, not soldiers and kings, but a kingdom of priests so that through your prayer, through your holiness, through your sacrifice, you can draw the nations away from the idols they've worshipped and back to the Father who loves them. And at this point in history, Israel, the Jews in particular, are becoming more Christ-like almost whether they want to or not. <laughs> you know, God is, is, is um, shaping His people. And He doesn't just do it through the temple. He doesn't just do it through the priesthood. He does it through suffering. This, is, this age is characterized by another unique feature that you don't really find in earlier periods. This is the age of martyrdom. This is the age where God the Father is calling the Jews to bear witness to the truth, not just by translating the Old Testament into Greek, the Septuagint, not just by refusing to uh, you know, worship the false gods, but now you find God requiring His people to bear witness to the truth of the faith with nothing less than their lives. Yeah. Animal sacrifice is one thing. Self-sacrifice is another. 
And God wasn't content with animal sacrifice. He never really wanted it. He only saw that the, that the Jewish people needed it to break them from the idols of the nations. So in weaning them from that, God is leading them to a much greater sacrifice, a, a, a sacrifice that we ultimately see perfected and fulfilled, embodied in Jesus Christ, our high priest, our king, the sacrifice of ourselves. Okay, you're talking then that, that we're entering a period that is marked by martyrdom. Exactly. Are you speaking specifically now about the, the Maccabean revolt? That, that, are, you, are we still in Ezra and Nehemiah? Sure, we, we can look at Ezra and Nehemiah, we could look at the Maccabees, we could also look at Daniel. For in Daniel you see what happens when a person won't bow before a Gentile emperor. Off with his, that's right, exactly, execution. What happens to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They're put in a fiery furnace. Now all of a sudden, the Jews aren't just teaching the truth, they're having to live it at the expense of their own lives. And I gotta tell you, thinking of Mother Teresa again, nothing compels belief so much as living the, li the, uh, the, the, the sacrificial love of Christ. And, and this is what we see Israel and the Jews gradually arriving at. It's exciting, mm -hmm. but it's hard, it's scary. Yeah. You know, it is for all of us, but in a certain sense, this is what God has been calling forth from his people since the beginning. Ever since Adam was called upon to lay down his life for his bride, if need be, you know, God has, 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 has called forth from us a love that is ultimately like the love of the Trinity. This is interesting because, uh, you know, when you, when you read the Old Testament and you come to the end, you sort of get this feeling that it's fizzling out, but what you're sharing with us is that it's not fizzling out, the burner is being turned up. That's right. It's a smaller pot, but the, the water's boiling now. If you judge things by externals, if you look at appearances and draw your conclusions, you're gonna miss the boat. Yeah, exactly. But if you look at the internals, if you look at the heart of the matter, you're going to see that God, by putting his people through the fiery furnace of persecution and exile, has forged for himself a people most Christ-like. And I think this is the foundation in the Old Testament for one doctrine that was so unique when I first entered the Catholic Church, the doctrine of redemptive suffering. The, the, the whole idea that in our suffering, we not only can express our love, but God can perfect and purify our love. And not just through martyrdom, but through the minor mortifications that we make throughout the day. We bear witness to the fact that earth is not our home. We are wayfaring strangers, we are pilgrims. It isn't the earthly Jerusalem, it isn't the promised land of Canaan. Ultimately, heaven and heaven alone is our home. And with that in mind, we can sacrifice anything. As Jim Elliott put it, he is no fool to give up what he can't keep earthly things to gain what he can't lose. This is a message that we should all take to prayer. We're going to come back in just a minute and consider much more of what this period teaches God's people. But I'd ask you, ask the Lord in your prayer this week, how can I live out my faith, my hope, and my love in redemptive suffering? How can I accept the contradictions of the day? How can I express my love through minor mortifications? The Bible really makes all of that come alive. We'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> Welcome back to Our Father's Plan. If you just joined us, we're in the middle of a discussion right now with Dr. Scott Hahn, and uh, we're at in the, really at the end of the Old Testament. It's an exciting period. Same, things seem to sort of fizzle down, but we're learning from Dr. Hahn that God is really turning up the heat. We're right now talking about martyrdom, and I'd like to just continue talking about this. It's fascinating to me, uh, the subject of martyrdom and redemptive suffering. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I really enjoyed becoming Roman Catholic in many ways, for many, many reasons. One of them was getting into Maccabees, first and second Maccabees, because second Maccabees seven soon became one of my all-time favorite Bible passages. And if you have a Bible, turn with me to 2 Maccabees chapter 7 because there we see all of the theory put into practice. Here's a mother with seven sons, and they're all up against Antiochus Epiphanes, who almost embodies a kind of antichrist. And he is trying to make them, he's trying to force them to eat forbidden foods. He's trying to force them to overturn the law of the covenant. And what happens is so amazing. Uh, it also happened that seven brothers with their mother were arrested and tortured with whips. 
and scourges by the king. Why? To force them to violate God's law. One of the brothers, speaking for the others, said, What do you expect to achieve by questioning us? We are ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of our ancestors. At that point, the king in a fury gave orders to have the pans and cauldrons heated. And they're being heated. Then he gets the commanders to take this, this, this son, cut out his tongue, and then scalp him, and cut off his hands and feet, while the rest of his brothers and his mother looked on. When he was completely maimed but still breathing, the king then ordered them to carry him to the fire and fry him. As a cloud of smoke spread from the pan, the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die bravely. It's breathtaking, but it gets better. Saying such words as these, the Lord God is looking on. It's like an ultimate trial, a test, a contest. The Lord God is looking on and he truly has compassion on us as Moses declared in his canticle when he protested openly with the words, and he will have pity on his servants. When the first brother died in this manner, it goes on to say that they brought the second one and then the third and the fourth. They brought the second to be made sportive. After tearing off the skin and hair of his head, they asked him, will you violate the laws of God rather than have your body tortured limb by limb? And again, answering in Hebrew, in the language of his forefathers, he said, never. So once again, they begin to torture him. At the point of death, he said, you accursed fiend, you are depriving us of this present life, but the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. It is for his laws that we are dying. Some people suppose that Old Testament Judaism was strictly a this worldly religion. This man's testimony betrays that mm -hmm. as false. Mm -hmm. No, these people realized that all of the, the kingdom and all of the temple, these things were earthly signs pointing to heavenly realities, mm -hmm. temporal, transitory institutions pointing us to our ultimate eternal home. The third son, the fourth son, the fifth, they all go down faithfully. They all go down pointing to the, the fact that the Lord will raise them up. But I think the most exciting and in some ways the most terrifying was the seventh, the youngest son. Verse 20 we read, most admirable and worthy of everlasting remembrance was the mother who saw her seven sons perish in a single day, yet bore it courageously because of her hope in the Lord. Filled with a noble spirit that stirred her womanly heart, she exhorts each of them in the words of their forefathers. Here's what she says. I don't know how you came into existence in my womb. It wasn't I who gave you the breath of life, nor was it I who set in order the elements of which each of you is composed. Therefore, since it's the creator of the universe who, shape, who shapes each man's beginning as he brings about the origin of everything, he in his mercy will give you back both breath and life because you now disregard yourselves for the sake of his law. And Antiochus Epiphanes, looking on, suspecting insult in her words, thought he was being ridiculed. And here is the seventh, the youngest son, the only one still alive. As the youngest brother was still alive, the king appealed to him, not with mere words, but with promises and oaths, to make him rich and happy if he would simply abandon his ancestral customs, the law of God. He would make him his friend and entrust him with high office. But the youth paid no attention to him at all. The king appealed to the mother, urging her to advise her boy to save his life. After he'd urged her for a long time, she went through the motions of persuading her son. <laughs> she, she looked to Antiochus as though she had changed her mind and she was now urging him to follow Antiochus. But in derision of the cruel tyrant, she leaned over close to her son and said in their native language, son, have pity on me who carried you in my womb for nine months, nursed you for three years, brought you up, educated and supported you to your present age. I beg you, child, to look at the heavens and the earth and see all that is in them. Then you'll know that God didn't make them out of existing things. And in the same way, the human race came into existence. Don't be afraid of this executioner. Be worthy of your brothers and accept death so that in the time of mercy, I may receive y'all back again. I added the southern accent there. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I'm down here in Alabama. She had scarcely finished speaking when the youth said, What are you waiting for? I'm not going to obey the king's command. 
I obey the command of the law given to our forefathers through Moses. But you, he's speaking now to the emperor, to Antiochus himself, but you who have contrived, contrived every kind of affliction for the Hebrews, you will not escape the hands of God. We indeed are suffering because of our sins. Through our living Lord, though our living Lord treats us harshly for a little while, to correct us with chastisements like a loving father, he will again be reconciled with his servants. But you, he's speaking now to the king, you wretch, vilest of all men, do not in your insolence concern yourself with unfounded hopes as you raise your hand against the children of heaven. You have not escaped the judgment of the almighty and all-seeing God. My brothers, after enduring brief pain, have drunk of never failing life under God's covenant. But you, by the judgment of God, shall receive just punishments for your arrogance. So like my brothers, I offer up my body and my life for the laws of God, imploring God to show mercy to our nation soon and by afflictions and blows to make you confess that he alone is God. Through me and my brothers, may there be an end to the wrath of the Almighty that has justly fallen on our whole nation. And at that, the king became enraged and treated the youngest brother even worse than the others, since he bitterly resented the boy's words. Thus he too died, undefiled, putting all his trust in the Lord. The mother was last to die after her sons. Even the mother was executed. What a story. What a testimony to the covenant family bond that is established by God with us as his children to bring us into eternity so that we will enter into the life of the blessed Trinity and there and there alone find our home. May God give us the grace to long for that and nothing less. Yeah. That's the key to it all. And are there any other examples that you can think of during this period of living this out? Well, on a more practical tone, on a yeah. more practical note, yeah, because <laughs> most of us are not going to be I'm martyred before sure the I'm not sure I'm ready for week. that one yet. Yeah. That would wreck my day. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, I think of Nehemiah. Uh, in chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6, you see Nehemiah doing his daily work. Okay. And in a certain sense, you know, mortification is daily martyrdom by installments, you know. And it might seem less glorious, but sticking to the work at hand, and sanctifying your work through prayer, yeah. knowing that this is the work of God, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, Nehemiah is the exemplar. Now, re just to recap, Nehemiah returned and he's rebuilding the walls, the fallen walls of That's Jerusalem. That's right. Okay. Uh, Ezra the high priest is already ministering in the temple. Nehemiah is more like a lay person mm -hmm. who's got uh, a menial task of construction. He's a construction worker. I mean, he's got some civil authority, of course, but he's going about the rather mundane task of building the walls to protect the Jerusalem temple. His previous job wasn't too bad. No, that's right. <laughs> Cupbearer, wasn't he? Yeah, indeed. So here is Nehemiah, mm -hmm. building the walls, surrounded by enemies. So what should he do? Well, he's got a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. He's busy working at the task at hand. At the same time, he knows he's got something holy to protect. I think that really signifies, that embodies the life of the lay person today. Busy at our work, sanctifying our work through prayer. At the same time, we have the sword of the, the Spirit, the Word of God. We know there are enemies out there who would take us down from the walls, mm -hmm. who would distract us from the work we're supposed to do. And in fact, in Nehemiah chapters 4 and 5, there's Sanballat and Tobiah. There are these Samaritans who come along and say, hey, Nehemiah, come on down from the walls. You know, we're Samaritans. We're, we're sort of like you know, uh, kin and cousins to you, why don't we discuss in some ecumenical context the task you're doing so that we can be included, you know? Sure. And, and Nehemiah Have is a conference. Yeah, have a conference, <laughs> a convention, some dialogue, you know? And these are valid requests, but not for a man who's been given a task. Mm -hmm. He has not been ordered to enter into ecumenical dialogue with the Samaritans, as good as that might be. Sure. He's been given his marching orders, and they are, build the wall to protect the Jerusalem temple. And so he says no, over and over again, <coughs> until he sees Sanblit and others, you know, devising strategies to attack. And at that point, 
the sword is wielded. You know that a person that's been called to be to, called to a task needs mm -hmm. to be sanctified. They need to separate themselves for that task. And, and people that get things done, like Mother Teresa, Mother Angelica, these are people who sanctify themselves. They know how to say no to the non-essential. Exactly. You know, holiness is badly misunderstood by people who look and say, look, to be holy means to be set apart from all the others because the others are bad. That's only the half-truth of it all. The other half is, yeah, you are set apart from the others because they're bad, but you're set apart for the others. That's right. You know, I used to say all the time that uh, being sanctified without a task or purpose is like uh, toast with no butter. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, dry, it's dry and eventually, who wants to do that? I mean, who, really, who wants to, to be involved in the church with no task? That's right. You know. You fall into self-righteousness. And, and Nehemiah knew that the best thing he could do, not only for the Lord, but for Sanballat, and all the enemies in the nation surrounding him was to rebuild these walls yeah. because this temple isn't just for me, it's also for you. And once I get my work done, you're going to discover why I couldn't dialogue with you because I had to focus on something you needed just as badly as I needed and you just didn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. Now, we've moved from the Maccabean mother, you know, of the seven sons to Nehemiah who's got this, this work of rebuilding the walls. But I would suggest in closing, that we have an even more practical way to go about doing this. And again, we can find it in the scriptures and we can find it in this period of the return and the Maccabean period. Uh, I'm thinking now of Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter four, the prophet is preparing the Jews for the coming of the Messiah for the day of the Lord. And he says that the, 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 the day comes burning like an oven and he goes on to describe what it'll be like. Verse 4 says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. For behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And so here, Malachi is announcing the imminence of the coming Christ. So what should we do? Climb up the highest mountains, build tents, and wait expectantly, and suspend all of our practical labors? On the contrary, the very next verse, in fact, the very last verse of the Old Testament is, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land once again with a curse. So here is the word for us today, I'm convinced, that in a period of exile, or when we're returning from exile, when we're surrounded by opposition, when we're under the domination of unbelievers or pagan influences, this sort of thing, what should we be doing? Well, we should be willing to lay down our lives like those seven sons. We should be willing to rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. But how do we do it practically? I would say most of us do it by turning our hearts back to home and seeing that God's greatest work is that hidden work that is done in our marriages when we say, I'm sorry, or when we say, thank you, or when we say, honey, how was your day? Sure. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, it's just, isn't this uh, uh, turning our hearts back to our families, our wife, our children, isn't this sort of like the work of Nehemiah? We're on our wall and we've got a lot of distractions. There's a lot of sand ballots out there that are saying, uh, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? But it's going to take us away from our children. It's going to take us away from our families. That's right. If the church is understood as a temple and the family is a domestic church, then it's appropriate for us to see that the family is also a spiritual temple. Mm -hmm. And we are called upon to rebuild this temple, especially in our day and age, because the family is under siege. The family is assaulted by, 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 by laws, by, by practices, by television, by all kinds of forces. And you know, we can't counteract them all, but what we can do, we must do, and that is start at our marriages and learn self-sacrificial love in the everyday practical details. And I know my wife is going to watch this show, <laughs> hear this and remind me of it. But also ask the Lord to turn our hearts more and more each day to our children. Because when we do that, we image God, not just in theory, but practice. We become fathers who are faithful, compassionate, yeah. gentle, merciful, in playing baseball, playing catch with their kids, and teaching the catechism. Are you telling me these are spiritual things? 
these are spiritual things. That's yes. good. That's in fact, good. I believe they're just as spiritual as, you know, praying the extra rosary mm -hmm. that you might do instead of going out and playing catch with the kids. Mm -hmm. My wife often says you've got to play as well as pray, yeah. you know, and the play done in the name of Christ is holy work. You know, there was one time was during the Gulf War back in the early 90s, uh, they were showing Saddam Hussein and I was with my little, you know, the little box changing channels and my daughter, Carly, was uh, playing on the floor and she turned around and she said, Dad, let's wrestle. And I said, Honey, just a minute, just a minute. And I'm clicking through the channels and I'm trying to find out what the Gulf War. She says, Dad, let's wrestle. And it was like the Lord just convicted my heart at that point. And he said, Here, I have given you this beautiful little child, fortify your own family. And here you are giving your attention to Sanballat, to Saddam Hussein, trying to find out what's happening in the Gulf War. And I was so convicted. Finally, I put the little change her down, told my daughter, come here, we wrestled on the floor together. And I'll tell you what, there was, I, I received more uh, love and it's just a tremendous time rather than giving myself to those things that I'm not called to. And we only have a few more minutes left. You know, this reminds me the, the scripture you just told us in Malachi from Malachi 4, family. That's really been our theme throughout this whole Old sure. Testament study, isn't it? It really has been. Uh, our Father's plan is all about the covenant family. Yeah. The old covenant is a natural family, an earthly family, a human family, the Adams family. You, know, <laughs> you think of the TV show, a bunch of lovable monsters, that's who we are as human beings. We're a bunch of monsters that God loves right. and He is going to take out that monstrous nature of sin and make us part of a new covenant, a new family. Not earthly, but heavenly. Not human, but divine. Not temporal, but eternal. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we'll learn We'll discover, we'll experience that earth is in our home, heaven is, and not just going up into the clouds, but in the book of Revelation it says there is no temple in the heavenly Jerusalem, for the Lord is the temple. We are going to dwell in the Lord God Almighty. The Blessed Trinity will be our home. There I think we're going to discover something that sounds very lofty is really down to earth. In the Trinity, the three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are constituted eternally by life-giving love. The Father gives His life away and that's what generates the Son. And then the Son images the Father dynamically by giving the gift of love and life back again to the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the bond which, which really binds the Father and the Son together in a communion of love. Now, how are we ever going to feel at home in this infinite, eternal fire of divine love? by learning to deny ourselves, by learning to sacrifice ourselves, by learning to become life-giving lovers in the little bitty things of everyday life. Yeah, becoming, That's like, the task. becoming like Jesus. Exactly. Think what you're and as we move out of the Old Testament into the New, I hope we don't move into the New without the Old, because it's the key. In fact, as we begin closing up this particular session, I want to encourage you to always turn back to the Old Testament. Whenever you hear a passage from the New Testament that you think you understand, maybe it's a text from the Old Testament being cited, I'd urge you to go back into the Old Testament and dig up the roots. Look at the context and study those texts in context because that will really open up the meaning much, much more than just simply reading the New apart from the Old. I'm convinced that the more the Bible, the whole Bible is read by Catholic Christians, the more Catholic Christians will thank God for their faith and will share it with other people. Not in an opinionated way, not with a Trump triumphalistic or proud spirit, but with the humility and the love and the contagiousness of people who have fallen in love with their father. How can you do that? Well, I would suggest a few things. First of all, bring a friend to next week's session and ask them to watch it with you. Second, get a few tape series. Jeff has a few, I have a few, there are others out there as well. But make sure above all that you open up the Bible and read it. I've recommended helps before like the Navarra Bible which is a wonderful commentary. But in any case, get down on your knees, roll up your sleeves and dig into the scriptures. They're like a holy sandbox where the Father loves His children to play. God bless you. See you next week.
será de mi 